Welcome to the Introduction to Copy Number Variation with Droplet Digital PCR Instructional Module. My name is Frank Bisworn and I'm part of the Digital Biology Group of Biorad Laboratories. As many of you know, genes that are expected to occur in two copies per genome can sometimes be found present in one, three, or more copies. In few rare instances, the genes are missing altogether. Copy number variations often result in too few or too many dose-sensitive genes being present, thereby being responsible for phenotypic variability, complex behavioral traits, and certain diseases. Structural variants typically found include the deletion of one or multiple copies of the gene, duplications of part of the chromosome, trisomies, monosomies, and partial monosomies. To determine copy number variations within the cell population, the number of copies of the gene of interest is quantified and compared to the number of copies of a reference gene of known quantity. A reference gene is used to determine the number of cells that were analyzed for normalization of the gene of interest. In practice, this is a very simple process. In this example, let's say we count 6,000 copies of our gene of interest, 4,000 of our reference gene, and that this reference gene is normally present in two copies per cell. Our copy number for this sample is the number of copies of our gene of interest divided by the number of copies of our reference gene multiplied by the number of reference copies present in each cell. In our example, this would equate to 6,000 divided by 4,000 multiplied by 2 which equals 3. Our average copy number per cell would be 3. Where Droplet Digital PCR comes into play is in providing accurate counts. To run a copy number variation analysis using Droplet Digital PCR, we would use a probe-based assay labeled with FAM to quantify our target of interest and a hex-labeled probe for our reference gene. It is best to run these assays in duplex mode versus two individual well as it eliminates one source of variation, pipetting. Pipetting can easily vary by 5% or more from well to well depending on the volume that is pipetted. To prepare a DDPCR reaction, you would combine the primers and probes for each target, the DDPCR supermix, the DNA sample, and water. You would then process the sample in your favorite DDPCR system. Upon analysis for each sample tested, we will get a two dimensional plot with four clusters of droplets. In this example, there are droplets that are positive in the upper half of our plot. These are the, the droplets that amplified our gene of interest within them. If we calculate how many are positive and how many are negative, we see that. 5,957 droplets were positive and 8,042 were negative. This equates to 12,180 copies of our gene of interest per reaction. If we now look at the droplets on the right side of the plot, these are droplets that had the reference gene amplified within them. Here again we determine how many are positive and negative and see that 4,349 were positive and 6,950 were negative. This equates to 8,180 copies of our reference gene per reaction. All of these calculations, of course, are done within the analysis software. The typical output would look something like this. Here we see two graphs, the first of which depicts the concentration of both our gene of interest and reference gene in copies per microliter of reaction. The second graph shows the number of copies per cell. The error bars represent 95% confidence intervals. This is an example of eight wells run in duplicate, quantifying MIC and normalized to RPP30. These samples had copy numbers varying from 1 to 16 copies per cell. As you can see from these examples, Copy number variation analysis using Droplet Digital PCR is easy, straightforward, and extremely powerful. In conclusion, well of sorts. 
Droplet Digital PCR simplifies the process of copy number variation analysis by providing very accurate gene counts. The output is numerical and this greatly simplifies the calculation process. Additionally, multiplexing is easy and accurate due to the partitioning of the reaction into thousands of subreactions. This reduces competition for reaction resources and allows amplification of both targets unimpeded by one another. Before we go, I would like to share a few helpful hints. Tip number one, digest your DNA with a restriction enzyme that is just outside of your amplification region. This allows for any tandem repeat copies to be separated and randomly distributed in droplets. If not digested, these tandem or linked copies end up in the same droplet and are counted as one instead of as two or three. Improperly separated tandem repeats result in inaccurate quantification of the copy number and are often displayed as counts landing in between whole integer values. Digesting the sample with a restriction enzyme will allow proper separation and quantification. Additionally, digesting your DNA template allows for better dissociation of complementary strands. We generally assume that the initial denaturing step of 95 degrees for 2, 5, 10 minutes is sufficient to dissociate the DNA strands in our template, but this is not always the case. Factors such as buffer formulation, size of the fragment, GC load, and other parameters will affect this dissociation rate. Digesting the DNA into smaller fragments accelerates this process dramatically. Usually, the smaller the fragments, the easier to denature our target region becomes, resulting in more accurate gene counts. In most instances, the restriction enzyme can be added directly into the reaction mix before generating droplets. Simply add the enzyme, mix thoroughly, and incubate at room temperature from 5 to 10 minutes, and then generate your droplets. The second tip is to test multiple reference genes and select the one, two, or more that give you the most stable results. In some disease states, different portions of chromosomes can be deleted or amplified, and although often standard reference genes work fine, it's always a good idea to test and validate your reference gene for stability. We generally recommend testing four reference genes as a starting point and going from there. If a single gene is not found to be sufficiently stable, two or more genes can be run in multiplex to normalize our reference gene. In this example, we have our gene of interest being quantified using a FAM labeled probe on the y-axis and two reference genes being analyzed using hex probes on the x-axis. You will notice that the x-axis has four sets of clusters. The first for the negative droplets in black, the second cluster for the first reference gene in blue, the third for the second reference gene in green, and the fourth in red for the droplets that contain both reference genes 1 and 2 that have landed in them due to random distribution. Although this may seem complex to analyze, software can easily accommodate and analyze these clusters. The last tip for this session is to use pericentromeric reference genes when possible. Over the years we have found that reference genes on the extreme ends of chromosomes tend to be more unstable and as such we recommend selecting reference genes that are closer to the centromere. Copy number variation analysis is simple and straightforward. Drop a digital PCR offers a robust accurate method for quantifying both target of interest and reference genes within the same well. Remember that to get the most out of your experiment, it's a good idea to digest your template, test for the stability of your reference genes, and when possible use pericentromeric reference genes. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. For more information on Droplet Digital PCR and its various applications, please download the Droplet Digital PCR Applications Guide, Bulletin 6407 from Biorad.com. 
If you would like to browse our in vitro validated assays for copy number variation or to design your own, please visit biorad.com forward slash digital dash assays. Thanks again.